my topic is is really uh, focusing in on anterior spine surgery and the various corridors to the spine and how the retractor system that the TSI TDAN Phantom uh, system provides. The key points of the presentation are going to be the, the role of the approach surgeon, a little brief history of uh, spine surgery and also the corridors, the tools needed for success. I, I, we're going to talk about eight different types of cases. And we're going to just barely touch the surface of complications. I'm not going to really get into the details of the anterior technique because I would be talking for maybe three hours and that would probably bore you guys. That is an unfortunate event. Uh, you know, one thing I found on Zoom is comedy doesn't work as well. Uh, but I still, I have to put a little comedy in my presentations. And so this is a board meeting. And this is uh, when you ask your, your wife asks you a question if she's gained any weight. And the husband said you were never skinny in the first place. That's considered a COVID death in America. So some disclosures. I work with a number of spine companies. Uh, most of it is education, but I have kind of branched out and help helping in, in design of implants and delivery through MIS techniques. So in my opinion, the role of the spine surgeon, he's part of the team. He's part of this or the role of the access surgeon. He's part of the spine team. Uh, really the goal of the access and the approach surgeon is to do safe, timely, so very quick, a reproducible midline approach to the spine. Also, it's critical that you, you're able to identify, minimize, and deal with complications. And you really need to understand what the spine surgeon needs. If you don't understand what the spine surgeon needs, then you don't, you're not really part of the team. And you have to have a real good knowledge of spine anatomy, vascular anatomy, or urologic anatomy. So what I consider the responsibilities of an approach surgeon may be different than what other people across the country or across the world, but I think it's important that you're involved in the decision making, is this patient a good candidate for anterior spine exposure or oblique or lateral? You evaluate all the films, you decide where the incision needs to be, you're aware of the specifics of the device that are going to be used, uh, you're going to make sure you're monitoring perfusion of the left lower extremity, you want to make sure the patient's paralyzed when you're doing your operation. You don't want them moving on the table. You're going to protect predominantly vascular urologic structures, but sometimes you have to make sure you're protecting GI structures. And you want to share um, your concerns if any vascular structures are under undue tension with your spine surgeon. I'm a vascular surgeon. I think vascular surgeons today in America are probably the best position specialty to take care of retroperitoneal space, to take care of blood vessels and to do the approach. I think general surgeons 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were better trained in vascular today in America, at least uh, most general surgeons do not get a lot of vascular experience. And I think if you don't have a lot of it vas vascular experience and know how to deal with blood vessels, you probably should not be doing this approach. So real brief history, a lifts have been around longer than any other approach. So anterior approaches, long time. First, transabdominal, then it was retroperitoneal about 40 years later. Then T lift or P lift started coming around, T lifts came around. Then the MIS A lift technique came around in the latter part of the 90s. Sal Brow really pushed it in early 2000s in Los Angeles, California. Then X lift came around, O lift came around in 2012. And a new technique, which we're starting to do is uh, the supine oblique approach or supine ATP. The evolution has happened in the anterior space really by changing where you put your incision. We used to do it flank, now we do it midline. We used to do transabdominal, now we do retroperitoneal. We used to make big incisions, now we make small incisions. In my opinion, today's ALIF is MIS. And when I think of MIS, that means I don't destroy anything. I do it quickly. Just uh, about 15 minutes ago, I did an A lift at four or five, 45 minutes, skin to skin. And patient's going to go home tomorrow. Uh, the instrumentation for A lifts and artificial discs have improved. The, the access surgeons, spine surgeons have better understanding of the spine anatomy and the vascular anatomy. The dogma of proximal distal control is gone. 
Uh, we don't suture blood vessels anymore. Rarely we use hemostatic agents. And so those are big deals that have changed the quality of anterior spine surgery. This is probably the, the pinnacle article. If you're in this world of anterior spine surgery, you probably should read this. And Sal Brow is now retired, but he had a very big impact on anterior spine surgery. Uh, but there is always that question is, what's the best corridor to the spine? And there's some good studies out there now. And I think anterior spine surgery is going to be positioned such that it is the best approach to the spine to reestablish uh, sagittal alignment, get the lordosis that you want, you want, you get the best largest implants, but there's a lot of different corridors to the spine. The ones I'm going to focus in on are anterior, oblique, and then your direct lateral. What are the corridors that are best suited for anterior lateral or oblique. And there's a lot of factors that come into play. This slide just shows some of the issues that go through my mind. Obesity, previous abdominal surgery down in the lower quadrants, previous spine, previous retroperitoneal surgery in the middle, a previous aortic aneurysm, previous spine surgeries, uh, osteophytes, transitional anatomy. Those are all issues that cross your mind when you're deciding what is the safest approach. And that teamwork with the spine surgeon is where you decide the best approach is. So are there any shortcomings to anterior spine surgery? I say no, but that's just my opinion, but there are. You have to have an approach surgeon in most parts of the world. I mean, there are places in the, in the world that the spine surgeon does the approach and they do a great job. I, I don't think you have to be a vascular surgeon or a general surgeon. You could be a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, as long as you can deal with moving structures off the anterior aspect of the spine. So in America, most of the time, 90% of the time, there's a spine surgeon and an approach surgeon. So there's scheduling issues. There's blood vessels that can be damaged. And if you don't know how to deal with that, they're disasters. Uh, some people say retroperitoneal, or retroperitoneal ejacul or retrograde ejaculation is an issue. I think there's a lot of misconceptions on that. I don't think it's a, an issue if you know what the hell you're doing. Uh, some of the patients can't be done anterior only, and so they need posterior fixation. So sometimes some spine surgeons say, I'll do everything posterior. And then there's an income issue. At least here in America, we share the uh, pot sort of uh, kind of of the income that is generated from the case. So I'm not going to get into this slide, but it, it shows all the pros of anterior. So ALIF is anterior, direct lateral is LLIF. And ATP is either supine ATP or direct lateral ATP. And in my opinion, and I'll debate this with anybody, I think anterior spine surgery has the most positives. They're not all positive, but has the most positives. What's the most common operation done in America? This is some spine tracks data. There's no question that minimally invasive T lift or Open T lift is the most common operation that is done. A lateral surgery has increased a little bit over the last five years up to 2020. Anterior spine surgery has kind of stayed stable. Artificial disc really hasn't changed, it hasn't really grown much. So there is definitely more posterior spine surgery being done than anterior spine surgery. Why? Well, there's not enough anterior access surgeons that really embrace it and want to do it. So that's a bottleneck. Another issue is, uh, my spine guy is too slow. I don't want to sit in the OR for three hours and watch the spine guy pick out a disc space. Hell, I'm not going to waste my time. Or spine guy says, I don't want to share my my income with the access surgeon. I'm not. I'm just going to do it all posterior. Or the spine access surgeon is really slow and takes three hours to do an L5S1. The spine surgeon is not going to do the operation if you, you can't do expeditious approaches. Then there's the issue of scheduling, coordinating two surgeons. There's also the issue of insurance, sometimes won't reimburse for anterior spine surgery. Some spine surgeons never even have done an anterior spine operation in their fellowship. So they come out in private practice or academics and not trained to do anterior spine restoration. Some spine surgeons think they can do everything posterior, which they're basically either smoking crack or smoking too much marijuana because I don't think you can establish lordosis like you can do laterally or anteriorly in the posterior column. And then sp some spine surgeons want to do everything posterior because they're there anyways putting in screws. Lastly, uh, you know, 
you got to sometimes wait for the access surgeon to show up or there's delay. So there's an issue with scheduling. There's an issue with a case being too bloody or too many complications that kind of frighten some spine surgeons and you really shouldn't have high complications rate. So this little page, this slide here is an actual page that I give patients when I see them in the office. And why is my spine surgeon going anterior? And there's a lot, these are all great reasons. You don't damage any muscle. Now, now we're just talking standalone anterior or artificial disc. Don't damage any muscle, fast operation, 45 minutes to 60 minutes for a single level. Our average x-ray time is 10 seconds. Minimal blood loss, usually 25 cc's for an a, a lift, any of the levels. I consider it MIS, almost a near complete discectomy. Right here in the upper, my upper right quadrant looking at it is disc space that was removed from the canal. So you can do direct decompression. You can do indirect decompression by putting large cages. In. You can control lordosis anywhere from five to 30 degrees, extremely high fusion rates, a lot of variability of what you can do, artificial disc, fusion, corpectomies. And we're now doing a lot of these operations on a 23 hour stay basis. But you need the right tools. The tools are imaging, room setup, retractors, monitoring appropriately, and knowing how to deal with blood vessels and issues. I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but this is kind of my setup. I always keep the patient flat, no bumps. That tray right there is all I need. I use two Goulet retractor handhelds. I don't do Richardson's. I don't do renal blades. I don't need any of that. A sponge stick Kittner, a couple Kellys, some DeBakey pickups, and um, I, I keep the patient paralyzed. I'm on her pulse oximetry on the left lower extremity. I do not use cell saver. And I uh, like these silver glide bipolars because uh, they don't have tissue that sticks at the end. I always look at the Foley catheter at the beginning of the case and at the end of the case to confirm no ureter injury, as well as look at the ureter at the beginning of the case and at the end of the case directly. This is all old school, a bunch of retractors. If you're using this kind of stuff on approach work, maybe your hospital doesn't have uh, up-to-date retractor systems, but this is stone age. You're not going to be able to do uh, quick, safe, reliable anterior spine surgery with these retractors. And there are a lot of different retractors on the market. These are a couple examples. My favorite is TDAN. I, I have worked with TDAN for a number of years, but I have worked with Nuvasiv. This retractor here that's made of carbon fiber, I helped design that. Down here below that is uh, Globus's retractor. I helped design that. Uh, so there are good retractors out there, but I think TDAN out of all these five provide uh, the most bang for your buck. So TDAN retractor, why do I like it? Because it has a lot of flexibility. It, it, my workflow is a lot quicker because of what I could do. It has two point fixation. I have a lot of different blade selections. I have hinges that I can use for uh, basically looking or working in the lateral space and or, or in the oblique space. Now this part of the presentation, I just give it to you guys, but I'm not gonna talk about this. This is the way I view in my world, the five steps to approach the spine. So I decide where I'm gonna make my incision. I, then I gotta develop the retroperitoneal space. And then I gotta move blood vessels off the anterior aspect of the spine, which I call, which I call release and rotate, not proximal distal control. I don't use umbilical tape. I don't dissect a lot. I just release vessels and then move them off the spine. And once you do that, you have to establish a safe quarter, and that's where your retractor system comes into play. And then it's cleanup time. Make sure everything's okay, inspect the ureter, inspect the blood vessels, and then do your closure. So we're not going to go through those steps. If people have questions, particulars about any of the five steps, I'd be happy to answer those. So I'm just going to jump into some cases. So case one, standalone, ALIF, five centimeter incision, three screw system, no complications, 10 minute exposure, out of the OR in one hour, implant right in the middle. That's how a safe, expeditious and reproducible case should be. And I call it MIS. My, my T-lift surgeons get all pissed off that I put that and I make sure they put that on the board. So everybody can see this is MIS A-lift because it truly is MIS. This patient goes home the next day. Second case is a hybrid case, artificial disc at four five, ALIF at 5.1, vertical incision, that is same size, about five centimeters, tw exposure 20 minutes, 
skin to skin was about an hour and a half, implants midline. Consider that MIS. Here's a three level case. Now this is a front and back. You don't see the posterior hardware because I leave right when I'm done with the front case. So I rarely have all the posterior hardware in place when I take pictures. But my incision is below the belly button. The approach was 30 minutes. All these implants are basically in the middle. And these, this is a globus cage with, uh, with anchors. So these, case, these cages go in nice and quick. And so this was probably a, close to a two hour operation. Next case is a four level case. People say, ay, 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 I can't believe you're doing four levels anteriorly. Well, you could do it. I don't do it anymore. I kind of, I do two levels anterior and two levels oblique. This was just to illustrate the power of the A-lift. You can basically correct a lot of the scoliosis with fusion cages anteriorly, but it's a big incision. And I think when we now have moved to the point where we're using a small incision for four or five and a small incision for a two, three, three, four obliquely in the supine position. And it's a little bit less dissection and a little bit less strain on the fascia. Again, exposure 35 minutes. This is probably a three hour operation in total. Now this is a L34 direct look lateral. So I, I expose, I got about 22 spine surgeons I work with. I expose for two of the spine surgeons in their lateral surgery. They don't want to deal with it. So I do direct look. I don't do dilators. I just go to the psoas muscle. I use the T-dam retractor with a hinge. So you can see on that picture where my hands are crossed, there's a hinge in between the ring. And that allows me to cup the, the aspect of the lateral torso. And I use two 25 millimeter blades and usually two 15 millimeter blades. In this picture I have Two, three 15 millimeter blades and one 25 millimeter blades. And this is a globus cage, standalone cage. And our incision is probably four centimeters. And this was a guy, I wasn't gonna do an A-lift on this uh, gigantic patient at three, four, but I'm happy to do a lateral exposure. So this is a, one of the first cases. I, I don't think many people in the world have done this. So I did a lateral. This is with Nuvasive system. The retractor system. You can tell it's new basic right here on this picture on the right lower quadrant. That's a graphite or excuse me, carbon fiber. So I made, I marked my incision here. I put the patient lateral. I put some posterior bolsters. Those are intermet uh, hip bolsters. I made my incision minimal, I uh, midline, and I just approached the spine right down the middle. It was hard. I, I don't recommend doing it. I don't do it anymore because the fat is even more difficult when you put the patient lateral. But we were able to get three screws in and we were able to do this as a standalone case. So it can be possible. This is not an OLIF. It's a little bit different. OLIF, you're going to come out more obliquely and not direct lateral in your incision or direct medial midline in your incision. Now, this is something that I, I've coined the term supine ATP. And supine ATP is basically working in that lateral corridor. This is a case that I tried. You see this picture here with the steri strip. So I tried to do an A-lift retroperitoneal. This patient had multiple previous abdominal surgeries. I couldn't get in the retroperitoneal space. So my second algorithm is to try, excuse me, transabdominal. When I got in transabdominal, there was just a gigantic amount of adhesions. Couldn't do it. So then I switched over to the, keeping the patient supine, I made an oblique incision, tilted the table 25 degrees. You can see this picture with the retractor blades. I have a hinge and the spine surgeons on the left side of the patient working in this oblique corridor. We put two nuvasive cages at 35 degree insertion points, but we can only put in one screw, but this patient was gonna be a front back anyway. So we were able to move along with the posterior part at that point. So. That is the supine ATP and utilizing the same retractor system, but placing a hinge. You can do corpectomies anteriorly. This is an L4 corpectomy. And this is, uh, this is kind of illustrating what I talked about when, when I said four level a -lift. I don't do four level a -lifts anymore. So this is a patient that had a previous lateral fusion x lif at L2, at L3445 and had adjacent disc disease above and below. So my first operation, first part, patient prepped in the same setting. I did the ALIF of uh, 5S1. Then I changed my retractor blade. I, I buckled it around the side of the patient. I turned the patient 25 degrees. 
and I approached L2-3 in the oblique corridor, placed a spinal elements cage obliquely and one screw. So that patient had everything fusion done anteriorly, then they flipped that patient and put screws in posteriorly. So what, what was the goal of that patient? Reduce a position change. So I'll call that single position surgery from the standpoint of fusion. And those are our cases that we're gonna talk about. And having two daughters and the bikinis that they're wearing, I'm convinced uh, this is the explanation for global warming. I'm not gonna talk about all these access related complications. I don't know if you guys are gonna have access to the presentation, but this is an, a really encompassing list of as a, an approach surgeon, you need to be able to manage all these problems and be able to be aware of these problems. The factors that influence the increased incidence of those complications are all these factors. Four or five, there's more vascular injury. Obesity, more problems. History of peripheral vascular disease, inflammation, osteophytes, spondylolisthesis, transitional anatomy. These are all things that have been associated with more vascular problems. And if you're an approach surgeon in the early part of your career, you're going you're gonna to get into trouble when you do these cases. And ultimately, you're going to have to do them. But these are the type of issues that are going to increase your complications. So 3% is what I say. If you're, if you're looking at your data and you're having higher than 3% complication rate, you need to go back and really study what you're doing. You're, 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 you shouldn't have more than 3% complication rate. These are kind of some articles that kind of illustrate that. Look at some meta-analysis and look at historical complications. This is a slide of my data, kind of my historical data up to 2019. I, I wasn't doing a ton of anterior spine surgery in the first five years of my practice. Uh, but towards the in the last five years of practice, I pr pretty much do predominantly anterior spine surgery. I do very little vascular surgery now. So it has an impact on my practice, but I'm, I'm doing something I enjoy doing and I do it well, so I keep going. But just to kind of give you a flavor of what my complication rate was in my first five years, my first 350 patients, it's not bad. I had almost 1% arterial complication rate. 2% major venous complication rate. So I'm below 3%. That was good. I didn't board any cases, but I was more selective in the beginning. I, I would say no to cases that I thought I was going to get into trouble. No retrograde ejaculation. That's some pretty good data. If you look at my last five years, I'm taking care of more spine surgeons. I'm doing about four to 500 cases a year. My arterial complication rate is 0.2%. My major venous complication, 03 So I got it down to 0 0.5. And I abort three cases out of all these. And that's probably because I don't say no much anymore. So I end up, you know, every once in a while, I have a case that I can't bring to completion. But again, retrograde ejaculation, one patient out of that number. I, I, when people say they're having a lot of retrograde ejaculation or post-operative ileus, I just, I, I, I don't get it. They're doing something wrong if they're seeing that much of a complication rate. So complications what impacts them is, and what made it less is going from transperitoneal to retroperitoneal, improved instrumentation, better retractors, better hemostatic agents, and maybe to a certain extent, picking patients more carefully. These are all the vascular structures you should be aware of. If you're an approach surgeon watching this presentation and you say, ooh, what's, I never even seen that vessel, then you, you're not doing a lot of these cases or you don't know where that vessel's at. But these are vessels you will encounter. You really need to understand anatomy. I, I look at the CT scan and MRI, I scan through it. I'm looking for anomalies. I'm looking for osteophytes. I'm looking for duplicated IBCs. All that stuff you should pick up before you make an incision on a patient. There's also anomalies of the urologic system. So, and there's also anomalies of the spine. So transitional anatomy need to be aware of. Uh, the pearls of reducing vascular injury. I could spend 20 minutes on this. I leave this here for you guys to talk about if you wanna talk about it after. But it's, these are the steps I think how you reduce your vascular complication rate from 3% to 0.5% is really embracing all these issues. One big thing for arterial problems is I always have a pulse oximeter on the left lower extremity, and it's a good pulse oximeter. This is an example, nice waveform. I have the retractors on a little bit. My waveform goes down. Now I have flat line. 
Am I going to panic? No. I increase systolic blood pressure. That doesn't help. I release my retractor after about 10 minutes. But at the end of the case, I want it to look like it does towards the left. It has to have the same wave pattern. It has to be 100%. Hemostatic agents are awesome today. I rarely will use a proline suture to fix a hole. So this is fibular, uh, tacloceles from Baxter, fibulars from Cordis J&J. These, these are like... I, I don't open Taclaseal or Everest, which is another very hardcore hemostatic, but every case I have a one pack of fibular open and I use that during the case. Some tunnel vision stuff and things to be aware of, you know, just make sure your spine surgeons realize, hey, the disc is important, but all this stuff up here is important. And here's an example. Don't just look at the end of the tunnel. You don't wanna to be towing against the top of the retractor blade. You don't wanna to be towing against the bottom. Uh, you don't want to get your kerosene clipping willy-nilly down here because a vessel may pop out and they don't really see it and they clip into the vessel. You also, when you put the implants and the trials in, you want to make sure that vessel is out of the way, especially when they're banging on the spine, the vessel sometimes will pop out. Uh, so those are things that can happen. These are the things, how you master the approach to the spine. There's a lot here, uh, stuff we can discuss at the end. Uh, how does TSI, uh, TDAN uh, facilitate uh, training and help you guys? Uh, they, they provide a great retractor system. Uh, picking the right blades, uh, understanding how to use the retractor system and rotating the system and the blades, um, the application for different corridors. And as, as more and more as the educational process goes more Zoom, I'm sure there's gonna be more educational stuff that we'll be doing with seminars and videos illustrating how we do this. So spine surgery is a team operation. I knew this would get the attention of some Argentinians, but so to make it fair, congratulations guys. And thanks a lot. Now, I, I'm gonna make sure I have my volume high. I visited the TDAN headquarters and I, was, I had the opportunity to see this machine. And this machine has a great sound. It's like a machine gun. That's how they uh, polish their uh, retractor blades. Thanks a lot. From uh, Ernesto Lombardo, uh, asking for the lateral incision. Is uh, always the, the left side? It's okay? Uh, it doesn't have to be on the left side, but it, it, you gotta be careful when you start doing it on the right side because the, you got the liver so you got to you got to be aware where the liver comes down. Usually the spleen's not in the way on the right side, but it, it from lateral spine surgery you can do either way, and and it also depends. And I don't do a ton of lateral work. I have two of twenty two surgeons that I do lateral approaches. I think a lot of it has to depend on where the 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 defect is on the spine. Like what is the easiest way to get into the spine? And you're going to want to pick that side. And, you know, you have the limitations in lateral surgery is the lower aspect of the rib cage. So you're going to be thinking about a various, various anatomic issues of where you want to go, lateral left or lateral right. Por Claudia, y el doctor eh, Pablo Sirna está preguntando cuáles son los tipos, eh, los tips para colocar el alif en L2, L3. So, at dos tres, L two three. I don't do, uh, I don't do a lifts at L two three much anymore. I used to do any time. I, I didn't care, but the two three is tough. I think two three is much more easier approached in the oblique corridor or in the direct lateral corridor. So, in my world, I do anterior L five S one, L five S one, L four five. L5S1, L45, and L34. I rarely do L23 anymore. So you can do it. You can do it retroperitoneal or you can do it direct transperitoneal. Uh, but I prefer to do that oblique ATP or direct lateral. There is another question they are asking. Uh, Dr. Daniel Agrello is asking, uh, what would be uh, the approach if there is a vascular um, damage? 
So you don't want to have a vascular damage, but let's just say if, if, if you have a vascular issue, like a stent, if you have uh, calcium, really bad calcium, I think as I, in the last three years, I've actually kind of converted to doing some stuff obliquely in the ATP space. The beauty of being in the ATP space, which is anterior to psoas, is that you don't have to move the blood vessels off the anterior aspect of the spine as much. So you can still get a good cage in. You can get an A-lift cage in. You just have to be able to have an oblique attachment. You know, A-lift, typically your attachment is straight on. You have to be able to attach obliquely, usually about 40 degrees, and you can get that cage in obliquely and you don't have to move the blood vessels off the anterior aspect of the spine. Now, it's a different thing if you're doing a lift and you have a vascular injury, how do you manage that? And that's a whole different discussion. But you add, in, in short, I don't go looking to put a stitch in. I take my fibular, I pack it, I put the TDAN retractor on, and we keep moving. Uh, my goal is to get the case done. And so if you start trying to mess around and fix that problem, you're going to make the hole bigger. There's going to be a shitload of bleeding and there, you, you may not finish the spine case. So your goal, your mission, get the case done. So pack, put the retractor blade in. Hopefully that stops the bleeding. If you're bleeding, you, you, you have to fix the bleeding. But normally if you put fibular, you put your retractor blade, you, you pack it off, you, you'll, you'll be able to complete the case and then deal with the bleeding after that. And then usually the way I deal with the bleeding after that is if I have to, I go to a little bit more robust uh, hemostatic agent like Everest, which is Johnson & Johnson, or Taclosio, which is Baxter. We have another question from Dr. Osberto de Leon. He's asking if the anterior approach is less costly than the posterior. I think it is uh, because I don't, I, I, like I said, I did an ALIF L45 just now, 45 minutes, skin to skin, uh, one device, four screws, done with the operation. I don't think there's too many spine surgeons in the world that can do a T lift or a P lift in 45 minutes. And Hardware wise, I would venture to say, so also in the ALIF, no neuromonitoring. So we don't have to spend any money for neuromonitoring. It, it, the standard of care out here is about 50% of spine surgeons use neuromonitoring, which costs a lot of money to the hospital, costs a lot of money to the patient. So, and the 50% do not use it. When you do a posterior operation, you're gonna be using neuromonitoring. So I think pound for pound, uh, the anterior operation is more cost efficient. There is another question, but I think you answered that one already. It's from Dr. Marcelo Amaro. If you have a vascular injury, what are your tips for someone who is not a vascular surgeon? This is a difficult problem because if you get into a bad vascular problem and you're not handling it well, it could turn into a nightmare. So most vascular problems are venous. So just picture this, venous injury. You start putting stitches in. You occlude the left iliac vein. The patient has massive DVT in the left lower extremity. Now you have to call orthopedics to do striker pressures. The compartment syndrome develops. You have to do four compartment fasciotomies because the patient's gonna lose the leg. So that's a disaster. That, 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 that patient is going to be negatively impacted by that operation. Another thing, you, you do a case and you, you, you rotate the artery and you occlude it. Now you have to do a thrombectomy. Uh, maybe it, you embolize to the digital vessels of the toe and they lose two toes. So all those impacts, I mean, I don't think you have to be a vascular surgeon to do this, but you have to know how to deal with the blood vessels and you have to know how to manage that problem. And if you don't have that down solid and, and if you don't and you decide to do it, okay, but you better have a good relationship with your vascular surgeon. 
And you better be able to say, hey, Joe, come on in. I, I, I'm in pro I'm in trouble here because if you don't have a good relationship, uh, you, you know, it depends on the, uh, the legal aspects. But in this country, a general surgeon who's doing anterior spine surgery, it, that's a perfect lawsuit. And I do a lot of medical legal expert work. And I see that. I always look, what kind of surgeon is he? General surgeon? And they didn't, they didn't call a vascular surgeon in the room to take care of the problem. I t I'll tell the, 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 the defense, settle this case. You're going to lose. That, that's probably something very particular about Latin America, that uh, in Latin America, we see a lot of uh, general surgeons doing approaches and, and they do it very well because uh, there are not surgeons who are only doing approach. Like it's the case in the States. Yeah. Well, I think that's the problem with the States. I think I'm a general surgeon. I did seven years of general surgery and I did a lot of vascular in my general surgery. So if I didn't do vascular, I probably could be good at doing anterior spine work. But there's a lot of general surgeons that are coming out today. They do not do much vascular surgery mm -hmm. and they know how to do the laparoscope, but they can't do vascular surgery. And that's a problem. 